Everybody. Welcome back to the Fitter and Faster Coaches Corner. Today I have a special guest, one of my fellow ASCA board members from Nashville Aquatic Club, Coach Doug Warham. Coach Doug, how are you today? Hey Mike, I'm doing pretty well. How about you? Where are you coming from today? Yeah, sorry I couldn't build on your momentum of tell me about your Zoom space. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'm in a hotel. My, uh, my daughter is at home with COVID and um, I am considered high risk. And so both my doctor and my wife suggested perhaps that I get the heck out of the house. And so I'm staying at the hotel across the street, which actually turned out to be pretty prophetic because of this terrible weather that we've gotten. So I've been able to walk across the street and pick up dinner and stuff like that. That's nice. And, and she's doing well, right? She's no, no effects or anything, luckily. Yeah, every, everybody, you know, so far, everybody is doing a Okay, and thanks for asking. And um, you know, we're hoping that you know we'll be we'll be out of the woods here. But I guess you know, you should never know. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. It's it's such an interesting time in our history, obviously, and and much has been said about the last few months. What are some of the things that you've had to do at NAC to kind of navigate some of these challenges? We've talked to a lot of coaches on Coach's Corner. We got away from it for a while just because it became routine, but. Here we are, we're almost one year into this and um, we're interested to see what you've been doing. And as one of the better clubs in the United States, I think people would appreciate getting your perspective. Well, you know, I think everybody, the, the true hard part about this is that everybody's had it so differently just based on factors that are completely out of their control. We've been pretty fortunate here in Tennessee. We, we weren't back online as early as some of the other places, the Georgias, the Floridas, the North Carolinas. Um, but we were able to be back in the water um, at the end of May last year, which golly feels like a lifetime. Um, and we're still dealing with essentially that they, they feel realistic, um, realistic restrictions on what we can do as far as um, lane space, uh, usage, number of athletes per lanes, what we're doing in our events. And so we've had to adapt in a couple of different ways. Uh, financially, we've had to adapt significantly. You know, we have a club where our revenue streams are set up in a couple of different ways to help support competitive swimming. Um, but with the absence of lessons, which have been even more impacted and our events and our auxiliary programming, um, it's just been been a tough go so we've had to make some changes there and and do some fundraising and cut back on some of our our hourly staff but i think the number one thing that we've done and i think this is probably part and parcel of what we feel like we do so well here is that we have um i think we've navigated really well the the realistic expectations of what the athletes can accomplish um in terms of both workout and then in competition and I would venture to say that we've probably had one of the best short course seasons. I've been here 11 years now. It's probably one of the best short course seasons that we've had in 11 years. Um, and I think that that's just a result of, you know, being realistic. Things aren't the same. Um, and I think that um, our athletes have benefited from us taking a, a, a different viewpoint towards what we, what we can accomplish and then what, our expectations are for what they can accomplish and they've benefited and so we it's been a lot of fun despite the the mess i i think it's great to see a program have success like that you mentioned one of the better short course seasons you've had in the greater context of what we're going through and it shows that you know things like resiliency and commitment to the values that your club uh exhibits NAC's been around since 1975, a well-established team. It's great to see that you were able to show your athletes that there are still pathways to be successful in the greater context of COVID. Yeah, well, and we, I have a lot of conversations with coaches who, you know, and everybody has their, their, their own viewpoint and, and way to go about doing things. But 
we've tried to learn from what other coaches are doing too. Um, we were able to learn from coaches that got back in the water before us. We were able to talk to people who were hosting events before us, you know, and learn things like, you know, we're not training as much as we'd like to be both in terms of duration and frequency. And, and so our kids aren't prepared to swim prelim final three-day meets. Um, it's just not realistic, um, but they are sure are ready to go and swim fast for, you know, maybe three to four events spread out across four uh, across three days um, if we can do that and so it's just taking those kinds of those pieces of information that you can learn from from other people and applying that to our own situation and and hoping for the best result i'm just really proud of our kids and our coaching staff and you know our our team parents and everything every it's been a full been a, it's been everybody's having to pull in the same direction in order to keep this successful for everybody. No sure. doubt about it. And Doug, some of the questions that I've asked other guests on the show who work for longtime established clubs, you, you know, your, your blue blood clubs like a Dynamo or a Nashville, what's it like to coach at one of these programs where there are, are certainly high expectations but one of the reasons why they've been so successful is because they understand the process of progression from age group to senior swimming and beyond. So yeah. talk about how you fit into that model at NAC. Well, I, I think a little bit tangential to that question is that I, I, we hear this a lot from, and I've experienced this myself, although I've, I've been here 11 years, which is a long time. And I, sometimes I think back and I'm like, man, I've been here for like 25% of the team's existence. Um, you know, we, there's, there's oftentimes there's an expectation when we bring staff in um, that just because we occupy kind of this specific um, spot within the, the overall picture of swimming that the kids are motivated and uh, they all want to be coached hard and, you know, the conditions are perfect. And I think that part of our, our success and, and our continued success is our continuous ability to try to push kids to be the best that they can be, um, which means a lot of different things. Um, I mean, it could mean the competitive side of things. It could mean um, our non-competitive side. Like I said, we've got a lot of different revenue streams here. Um, but just because, you know, we are been around and we've been successful doesn't mean that we get kids that are more talented or, or more coachable or any of those kinds of things. Um, it's just kind of a constant push, help kids achieve their potential. You know, my role here is, has at times been fairly unique. I think that we perhaps, well, I guess I can't speak to other, other programs, but I, I know that we set up our, our competitive groups a little bit differently than other places that I'd been before I got here um, and other other places that I know about. And, and so we tend to take and pull kind of our, our really talented kids. And, and when I talk really talented, I mean the really talented ones and put them into the senior group, sometimes as young as 12. Um, and so I've, I've straddled kind of this age group developmental high performance side into the senior side <clears throat> with these athletes. And and it requires a, a lot of uh, it requires a lot of effort. Uh, it's great to have those talented athletes, but it's also a blessing in seasons where we don't have them um, because it, it requires a lot of modification to what they're doing in and out of the water. Um, it requires a, a different eye towards you know what they're doing at the end of the season. And the, you know, and I'm, we're talking the really talented, the you know the the Gretchen Walshes, the um, Ella Nelson's, the Tatum Wade's, um, generally girls, right, that age. But it's 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 been a really cool situation because you get this opportunity to help these kids develop from the time that they are essentially still considered age group athletes all the way through. And I, I think that um, while of course there are plenty of exceptions, um, the majority of our high performance athletes follow that model. So that's been a fun part of my job. And then of course just you know, my role with the senior group is, um, you know, we just, we coded, we got one group at the top. There's, it's kind of split into two and, you know, John and I co-coach it. So it's, it's a lot of fun and uh, it's been a great place to work. There's no doubt about that. it's been fun to watch a lot of those athletes who you just mentioned their success and some of their meteoric rise over the last couple of years. 
fair to say, Doug, that their parents, those athletes specifically, uh, how did they buy into the programmatic philosophy and approach from you and John? You know, that's a great question. And it's something that we take really seriously. Um, with each of those cases, um, this isn't a situation where, you know, we lord over them and say, here's what you're doing. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a very interactive process between uh, us as the coaches and them as the parent when they're younger. Um, and we spend a lot of time to sit down and talk with them and explain to them, you know, what the philosophy is, how we can make sure we can manipulate the practice for the athletes in order to be successful, um, how we can manipulate what happens season to season in order to continue for their athletes to be successful. And then really, you know, oftentimes as a parent myself, you know, the, the, the question of whether or not it's peer appropriate always comes up. And so, um, you know, it, it again kind of, it forces, it forces us as the coaches to, to build a stronger, even stronger personal relationship with the athlete. Because oftentimes when we have kids in that situation, while we prefer to do it when there are multiples, that's not always the case. It's, it's a situation where the communication between the coach and athlete has to be even better than it would be in a normal athlete progression situation. And it's what makes it really fun. That's what makes, I mean, you know, I don't, I guess I'll have to say this on here, but that's the best part about it is working with these young athletes and, you know, getting to know them and, and what makes them tick and, and uh, guiding them along the path to be successful. Cause that's really what it is with the good kids. You're just guiding them. Like, you know, they're all, they're very good. <laughs> Chelps. There's no doubt about that, that some level of talent is certainly important, but the ability to create those dynamic relationships that will enhance performance, as, as you know, are key. I heard Coach Marsh say one time, I just try to get some of the best athletes in the world and not screw them up. And yeah, isn't that right? I, I think there's something to be said for that, right? Yeah, and I, I think the other side of it is, um, you know, the group culture is so important when you, if that's something that you're consistently doing, because you can't move super talented athletes into a group where the culture is bad. And, uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time that the hardest part of my job, without a doubt, um, is maintaining our group culture and our group expectations. And um, I think that sometimes, despite even our best efforts to try to communicate with a parent or an athlete, there are some people that that's just not what we want to do with that group's just not going to be the right fit for them. I, I don't regret it because I don't, you know, I, I sometimes wonder, well, well, you know, could we have done X, Y, and Z? But I, I don't think that you have a situation where you have the super talented athlete being successful without that environment. So I, like, I, I don't think that there's a, maybe a same level, you know, Ali Rob, Alex Walsh, Macklin Davis, without that group culture that's consistently driving in that direction. So it's, it's definitely the hardest part of my job and, and the most, I won't say confrontational because it's not, but, but that's where the hard conversations happen. And, and it's not fun, but it's necessary to, to keep the environment where it needs to be. I think one of the most challenging things of a club coach's job is to insert themselves in that point in time where a difficult conversation needs to take place, especially when you're younger and you're first coming up and you're, you're looked at on a, almost an even plane, right, with some of your older athletes because you're not that much older than them. Yep. But as you get older and you develop as a coach and the distance between that uh, familiar relationship expands and now you really have to get in there and say hey look we have a certain way of doing things here that promotes every single person on this team we want great teammates and so what are some of the things that you and John and the staff at NAC do to identify those leadership positions with within the team well I, I think first and foremost I would be I would be really not giving her her due if I didn't say that we work consistently with a sports psychologist that is something that we started doing her name is um, Abby Trevere and uh, that's something that we started doing a long time ago um, you know I was somewhere at a camp with Kate from AquaJet and 
we were just bouncing ideas around. She said, oh, you know, maybe it was how to have a difficult parent conversation or something like that. And she was like, oh, I just have the sports psychologist do that. We, it's probably been, I mean, it's probably been, we've been with her seven or eight years. So, so we've been working with her a long time. So working with her on kind of what that process is and helping the kids become the ones that set the tone for what their expectations are of themselves and their teammates has been really powerful. Uh, our job as coaches is to kind of put, you know, boundaries or, or wh- however you want to think about it on that. And, and sure, some years it's over here, it's a little better and some years it's over here and it's not quite as good. But the, the point is we stay in the lane and we try to give them as much of that ownership as we can. The, the, the athletes, you know, that are leaders there, and we could talk about leadership all day. Right. But, but there's so many different kinds of leadership that we want to make sure that we can put each of those kids in a, in a position where their type of leadership can shine. So whether that's, you know, they're the silent, hardworking type, um, and recognizing the kids that do that really well, whether they're the vocal leaders that are the ones that are out there encouraging their teammates. Um, we want to give them a platform to show who they are and what they can do. And it's, it's again, every group's different and every, every athlete is so different as the group changes that it's, it's different every year. And I've found that if we can give them that platform, that a lot of times they'll take that and run with it. And there, there's some sure that you have to be like, you can probably step into this role. And we do have those conversations um, oftentimes in a group setting with maybe four or five of them. And we say, Hey, listen, you know, next year, this is going to be your group. I want you to be thinking about what you want out of your group, how you want to, um, how you want to leave this place, you know, and are you going to leave it better than you found it? A lot of times when you empower a group, it becomes much easier to having that, that conversation with the background of, we work with the sports psychologists sometimes three or four times a year, maybe more depending on the, the group, whether they're female or male. I think it just kind of lends itself to kids developing in, in that way. I really appreciate that. And, you know, we here at Victor right now with some of our athletes, it's, it's a challenging time. So what a great year to have somebody like that as a resource. And what a great thing for clubs to use with USA Swimming Club Excellence money that they earn. It's a perfect thing to put that into. Yep. Uh, and, and I would encourage coaches to do that who, who have received the grants. You know, you meant one of the things that I love to do on Coach's Corner is mention other coaches, and you did it for us there. And you, you mentioned Kate Lungston, and uh, what a fantastic coach, and so able to plug herself into that psyche, right? Yeah, she's she is the best. I I've I've been lucky to work with Kate a couple times, um, both at camps and then on uh, teams. And I I don't you know I I think Kate gets along with everybody I think that's the way it is but I feel like Kate and I get along really well and we we were at the swim meet in 19 at Pan Am's we were the only club coaches on the Pan Am staff so you know you got all these college guys and and Kate and I are just over here you know working with with our athletes but you know we we can connect and have a lot in common and um i've learned a lot a lot from Kate in a short amount of time and i'm always continuously impressed with um, who she is, her approach, um, and um, the quality of athletes that they they turn out. They they do a, a fantastic job. Oh, no oh. doubt about it. There, there's always somebody coming down the down the pipeline up yeah. there. It's, it's yeah. fun to watch. Um, you know, we we touched a little bit on on mental health and the importance of that with our athletes. Are there anything that the staff is doing at NAC for mental health opportunities, or at least learning to create some balance in, in the coach life. You know, this is a really challenging profession as many others are where we, we travel often, we're home late, we're, we're, we leave the house early. Uh, it can be a, a really challenging work-life balance and that phrase is overused, but I think it's important to, for coaches to hear what, what some of the other teams around the country are doing. Yeah, I think that's, that's another great question. And, um, you know, that's something that, you know, as an ASCA board, I know that we have a mission of, of trying to, to push forward. And I read a quote the other day, um, maybe last week that, that said, you know, I, I finally figured out work-life balance and the answer is to work less. That really, that really hit home with me. I'm not sure that I had ever like connected the dots on that exactly. Um, but it really resonated with me. And, and I think that one of the other reasons that we have been able to be as 
I guess as successful or, or, or however you want to put it over the last decade that I've been here is the fact that I've been here. Um, and you have John that's been in place. I think he was the head coach. I think he was in Nashville before I was born. I, and I hope he watches this and he hears me say that. Um, but I think he's been the head coach since 1984, 1985. And so obviously that consistency and that, that gravitas tends to pay off when, when you're dealing with um, situations like this. But the fact that I've been able to come in um, and be here long term has meant that uh, we both have been able to enjoy a, a better situation when it comes to work-life balance. And I, I think that, you know, as other coaches, when, when, when I talk to other people about this, it's just about finding the right help. I, I don't think that when I go to a swim meet or John goes to a swim meet, our, our parents or our athletes, it, I don't think it makes a difference to them, whether it's me or John. And the only way we, you can do that or set that up is intentionally. Um, you know, through how the practices are structured, how the groups are structured, and, and then um, making sure you're taking care of your people. And I'm certainly very grateful to uh, John for not only um, bringing me on board, but then I've been able to really expand on my career and my opportunities by staying here in Nashville and, and not up and leaving, <laughs> which we thought about a few times. My wife's from Nashville, so that that always um, plays in into uh, the staying the staying card. Sure, sure, and and that's you know that's something that I think we we all explore throughout our career. Um, but I'm always interested in hearing you know how different staffs are handling that. And that you said you know I I figured out the work life balance and it's work less. That's a great quote. You know I think for a lot of us, especially at our age you know, we're going to take on as many things as we possibly can. And, and in that quest to, to find every possible pathway for our athletes. But it's important to remember, I think that we have things going on at home that that need us too. Yeah. And, and I think it's, we, all, we also have a great staff of assistant coaches, right? Which, you know, we couldn't do that without them. And I, I think it's, uh, it's important to, we've just got a great team. And, and anytime things are really clicking, it just makes it so much easier. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Doug, when you think about, um, you know, what our sport looks like for the future, there are a lot of changes happening recently. Obviously, the landscape of collegiate swimming has changed substantially since you and I were in college. We now have the ISL that, that we're all rooting for and, and will hope continue. But where do you see the future of our sport right now? I, I think maybe I'm bullish on the opportunities that will exist for clubs as things move forward. I, I think, you know, when you look back at kind of, you know, the early days, but the 60s, 70s, 80s, as the United States was really becoming this international powerhouse, it was the clubs that were driving a lot of that high performance and a lot of the opportunity. And, and I think over the course of you know, the next 30 years or so, a lot of that focus has shifted to the collegiate level. I, I guess maybe I'm of the opinion that as, as things move forward, I'm, I'm maybe not, maybe hopeful is not the right word because I, I think all of this is necessary, you know, in our ecosystem for, for there to be performance. But I, I think I see greater opportunity and greater stability in the club side of things. And, and I think that those of us that are intrepid and entrepreneurial enough to capitalize on, on whatever that means over the course of the next 10 to 20 years, there's, there's probably going to be a lot of opportunity there. And, and we see it already, you know, with, with colleges creating club teams themselves. There's no doubt that the club model is going to be here to stay. And, and there's still a lot of questions about you know, what collegiate swimming will look like. So it's all in our best interest for everybody to, to be working together and to be strong. But I, I guess I see, I see clubs perhaps, you know, occupying a space that they were more familiar with maybe 40 years ago. You know, it's interesting to say that because I really am interested in Coach Schubert's opinion of, of that too, because I think he, he is of a similar thought process. And what a great thing to hear for us from, from our standpoint, 
but also, you know, you and I both had great college experiences. You know, I, I think, you know, we want to make sure that the, that space survives. Mm -hmm. But it is good to hear that, you know, club swimming is going to be a, an integral part of the American swimming dynamic. Not that it hasn't been, but you're right. A lot of focus has shifted to the pro groups at college over the last 10, 20 years. Yeah, and I don't see, you know, or pro groups like David's group or, or, or wherever. Um, and I, I, I don't see any reason why that shift doesn't continue. Uh, you know, I know that we, you know, we have financially supported some of our postgraduates in the last um, cycle, um, just kind of laying the groundwork for um, our ability to be able to do that starting to build it into the budget and making it a little bit more normal because then I, I i know you probably feel the same way nothing gives me more pride than seeing our athletes succeed collegiately in representing their team but when when somebody calls me or sends me a text and says hey you know at nationals this summer i, I want to rep NAC. like that's my that, uh, call every uh, year. like that like i don't i you know I wish, I, you know, and everybody, I get it. You know, I get it if they don't too, or their coaches don't want them to. I, I understand that there's a recruiting angle, but, um, but man, like getting those, those calls and those texts is like, man, this is the best, this is the best feeling ever. And, and so, um, so I, I think that, I think that ultimately, yeah, I, I think clubs are in a great spot and I, I, I'm proud to be a club coach and, and, um, I consider myself a developmental coach with an eye towards high performance maybe, but um, you know, I love coaching eight and unders too. So there's just a lot of opportunity for people that want to be in the club space. And, and I think it gets a bad rep because there's so many situations that just aren't good and there's no way around it, you know, to go back to the, the work-life balance. There are some situations where it's not and, and working to find a good situation or to, to put yourself in a place long enough to make it a good situation, I think can pay dividends. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And, and, you know, it, again, it's, it's good to know that, you know, USA swimming has coaches that are pushing that club level success. And I think that's, that's really what we need. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, Nashville or the, or the team down the road that has 25 kids and they love to go to practice and they love to train and compete. Yeah. Uh, and there's so many places like that. And, and it's great to see that, you know, some of these teams are just starting to come back out and start swimming again. And I think it's going to be a good summer. I think it's going to be a really fast summer. Yeah, that's our hope. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I yep. think it's going to be a really fast summer. Doug, you are one of the very few coaches that I know, maybe a handful, that also have a, a PhD. Okay. Uh, talk to us about your PhD and, and why it became important to your progression as a coach. You know, Many, many years ago, let's see, it took me, let me get this number right. It took me, it took me nine years to finish. When I first came to Nashville, I was coming off of a, of a situation at a, a, a small club where I was working a hundred plus hours a week. It's like completely the opposite of what I had now. But I, I just, I, I like so many people and I, I think um, maybe we're, we're two great people to talk about this. There are a lot of young coaches and, and guys and gals that I knew coming up through my 20s that don't coach anymore because the situation was not a good one for themselves or their family in a lot of different ways. So when I came out of Nashville, I, I was, or when I came to Nashville, I was in shell shock from my previous job. And I was like, oh man, if this doesn't work out, I better have like a plan B. That's how I ended up going back to school. You know, my interest has always been in the organizational management side and the organizational structure side. That I think has really allowed our organization to benefit. Our, I think our club has benefited greatly from the influx of people and the population growth in Nashville. But through what I was learning and studying and, and putting together and researching, we were able to kind of derive this model that um, I think works really well. In doing so, we have been able to ensure a lot of things, a lot of financial stability for our coaches. We've been able to um, provide opportunities within the greater Nashville community to offer swimming. And so we've been able to do a, a lot of great stuff, I, I think, as a piece of, you know, what I was learning and, and working on. And it's been a lot of fun. You know, my my dissertation was on, you know, how clubs are, are organized and whether 
if you're organized or not, are you better at competitive swimming? That's that like, there's my two worlds like colliding. And so I had a lot of fun doing it and talking to coaches and, and doing the survey and all of that stuff and, and was able to identify a few things that I think could help people um, if they are trying to put together a high performance club. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, and it, and I do a little bit of teaching on the side just as a, as a fun thing to do, but uh, really it started out as my, my plan B. <laughs> well, it, that, that sounds like a dissertation that young coaches should read. Uh, well, I might be biased. Um, but I, I would definitely at least welcome anybody that wanted to to pick up the phone and talk about it, you know, and talk to anybody, as many people as you can, because I think there are a lot of lessons that you don't have to learn the hard way. You can find uh, an answer or, or maybe some guidance that can help you choose the right answer sooner rather than later. Uh, I'm glad we're speaking about this because I remember having some poignant conversations uh, sitting on deck at, at Santa Clara with another friend of mine who was coaching at the time and he said look like I, I have to pay out of pocket for health insurance you know I, I've got to set up my own you know 401k I've got to think about all these things and another time a, a coach who I thought was going to be in it for the long haul we're sitting on deck at, at Stanford at, at Nationals a couple of years ago same thing I just got married we're having another kid uh, you know, those are challenges that I don't think everybody understands when maybe they first get into coaching. You might be in for four or five years and then you think to yourself, all right, I, I've got my master's now. What do I do? Right. And so what are some considerations that you would advocate coaches taking as as they navigate that early process? And I know that this is something that, you know, we're going to be very passionate about with ASCA. And it's something that Fitter yeah. and Faster is, is very passionate about. Fitter and Faster is very passionate about helping coaches and athletes. Well, I, I think the short answer to that is, well, no, I never give a short answer. So I'll, I'll, I'll take that back. You know, mentorship is so important. The role that it can play in a coach's success or failure um, is critical. As a young coach, had I, I'd have to go back and count them now, but I think I had, I think I had five jobs in five years because I was always willing to. I didn't have anything at that point in time. I was willing to pick up and go for a better opportunity. It wasn't always financially the best opportunity. In fact, a couple of times it definitely wasn't. But it allowed me to have access or um, experience with a different level of athlete that I hadn't had before, and. So I, I think a willingness to put yourself out there is so important. And, and I would consider it now a minor inconvenience in the course of my career. In fact, I look back on it and I think there's a lot of positive. I got to experience a lot of different clubs um, in a lot of ways, right? Different geographical areas, different ownership models, different philosophies on athlete development, um, different LSCs and the... Um, process through which at the LSC plays a role in athlete development um, and kind of be able to form my own opinion. And, and I finally got to the point where I was like, I, I, and I kind of mentioned this before, I was like, I'm sick. I was a head coach. I was like, I'm sick of making these mistakes over and over again. Like there has to be a better way. And I was, I was talking to a buddy of mine again, that doesn't coach anymore, um, was a great, great age group coach um, and said, what, what should I do? And he was like, I mean, I work, you know, he worked for Pete Wright at the time. He was like, I work for Pete. Working for Pete is just the best because I don't have to really screw anything up. Like we can always go to each other with ideas. And, and, uh, and so I was like, oh, well there, maybe I should try that. Uh, so that summer, I, I, I would never forget. I, I was all in. I had kind of two opportunities. I had one to go and work with Kit Rollerson uh, when he was at RSA in Raleigh. And I had an opportunity to go to Nashville. John called me first. So I was <laughs> away, I went to Nashville, but that the mentorship part has played such a big role in my life. And having John obviously as really a direct mentor, but having the ability to pick up the phone and, and talk to you know Coach Mark Bernardino has been huge in my life and Coach Don Easterling has been huge in my life and and the as mentors and then you know the friends that I have that that are 
through coaching or just, I mean, it's an amazing support network. Um, and I just can't imagine going through a week without, you know, having to pick up the phone and call somebody and get an idea or get some input on, on something moving forward. So the mentorship's great and, and building friendships um, with people that you trust and that people that know what they're doing is so important. And, and I think that that's why I'm so passionate about, about ASCA and, and about the potential that it has, because I think that that's a group of people that can help guide young coaches in the right direction. No doubt about it. And, and I think everybody who's on that board right now is really, really in it with their whole heart. And um, I'm appreciative uh, of the people that are on that board. Yes, um, it's a lot of fun. It is. Yeah. All the haters out there, we're coming for you. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think people will be pleasantly surprised at how quickly it, it, it comes back around. I'm a hater too, so... <laughs> I understand. Uh, you mentioned Coach Bernardino. He, in this house, he is beloved by the athlete and the parents and, uh, you know, special, special person there and certainly uh, have been able to use him as a resource the last two years. And it's been great. You know, one of the things that I think is really important about the mentorship process is this day and age, you could have a mentor on the other side of the, the country. And so we, we really want to advocate, not just from the ASCA level, but bitter and faster too. you know, connect with coaches, connect with other athletes, connect with people and just learn more about the sport you love in a way that, you know, you can, you can share that with that person moving forward. I've always liked that about nationals. You know, you, you learn more sometimes at the hotel bar than you do uh, out there on the pool deck. You know, it's been really cool to, to, to see coaches progress that way. Yeah. And you don't even need to ask questions if you just, I think that's maybe what I like the best is I, I just sit and listen. It's a lot of fun. And, and that's a skill that I think we all, we all need to work on is our listening skills. Doug, I'm, I got some quick fire questions here for you. If all, you're right. Ready. all right. All right. So the, some of these are unpopular because they don't love answering them, but we're going to put them to you. I, you know what, I have been called an anti-establishment SOB <laughs> and, 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 you know, there are a lot of things that I'm passionate about that aren't, aren't exactly nationally popular and I'm okay with that. All right. The, the first one is, does the eight minute mark get broken at the Olympic games this summer in the women's 800 free? I hope so. I, you know, talking to Greg and um, it, the whole last couple of years, it seems so weird, but talking to Greg in back in 19 on some of that stuff she can do. Um, obviously if it's going to happen, she's the person to do it. So I'm, I'm all in, I'm in her corner. So we, so uh, on the show, I, I often bring that question up by saying she who shall not be named <laughs> will break eight minutes. But I think, you know, if anybody's going to do it, I think it's going to happen with her first. And what a moment that's going to be. That's yeah. going to be one of those, you know, for us, that's one of those Janet Evans type moments. I've seen, I've seen her, uh, you know, at the training center, uh, you know, on some of those sets that Greg's had him do some of those long course, best average stuff. And I, I would say it's very within the realm of possibility. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. All right. Will it take a sub 21 second performance in the men's 50 freestyle to win a gold medal? How cool would that be, by the way? Gosh, you know, there's so much up in the air with everything that's happened with COVID. Um, I'm going to go on the side of no. I'm going to go. It would be cool, but I'm going to go with no. There are a lot of guys that are right there on that, yep. on that, you know, knocking on the door. And so many consistent performers in that event. You know, Bruno Fratis has been 21-3 several times. Yep. yep. Obviously, Caleb, it, it, what's great about that race, and I don't love coaching that event, but what's great, what's great about that race is it's, it's, any, it's anybody's game, you know? Yeah, that's the beauty of it is that you got a lane, you literally have a chance. Absolutely. Um, what, what has impressed you most about the ISL or what takeaways do you have in this, this early part of that, that formation? I think that any time that we can draw interest and attention to competitive swimming um, outside of the 
you know, the predefined Olympic calendar is a great thing. And so their, uh, the engagement, their ability to get athletes in one place at one time and to put a, a unique spin on it, I, I think has been really valuable. And, you know, and whether it moves forward or not, I don't know, but there, there's certainly a model there by which I think um, we should be exploring and continuing to pursue. It's great. It, I, you know, I think it's great for the athletes too. It, and maybe it's too early to tell whether ultimately it long-term is great, but I, I think for, especially this year with everything that's been going on, it, it was, it was the right thing at the right time. The dynamics are changing. Athletes can swim fast whenever they want. True or false? Well, it depends on their coach. That depends on their coach. The athlete, yes, I think so. If you have, if you have the right situation, I like the answer. A little, a little guarded, but well guarded. <laughs> All right. So, uh, the final question today, Doug, and uh, we so appreciate you being on Coach's Corner, and uh, we're 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 thrilled to see that Nashville is is moving moving through this. What, in your opinion, is the most challenging world record on the books? Male, female, what do you think? I think that that, that male 200 free is pretty nasty. That's a pretty nasty record. People go to that one. People yeah, to yeah, that, that one's pretty nasty. And, and maybe that's because, you know, I have some bias with it too, like internationally versus, you know, American. Um, that's that's a pretty tough event for the Americans. Any really some of that freestyle stuff for our guys, but yeah, that's just a dirty that's a dirty time. And when that one goes down, that'll be pretty pretty awesome. Somebody's going to have to work really smart and really hard to make that happen. We're starting to reach a threshold of speed, I think, in middle distance freestyle events, 200 and 400. That you can't make a mistake in those distances at all you know you and i we were kind of waiting our whole athletic career to see all right who's going to break 130 short course 200 200 free. now it's happening yep you know how many yep. like when dolan went 408 in the 500 i was like that, that that's going to take forever to get that then now there's a couple guys always in the hunt you know mm -hmm. being maybe 405 you know yeah it's yeah it's, it's unbelievable it's a matter of when that, you know, those yard swims start to translate into what's happening, you know, long meters. And, and again, I'm going to just, I'll draw it full circle for everybody and say, I, you know, that's where I think I see, you know, the clubs being able to come in and capitalize on the speed gains and the, the you know, the technical gains that, that these athletes have been able to make through the collegiate experience um, and then having the clubs with an opportunity to allow them to continue to develop into international long course swimmers because that's what it is you have to develop into being an international level long course athlete um, I think that the future is very bright I'm really glad you said that because I think there is a certain perception throughout the process for some parents that high school states as a precipice then NCAAs is a preface. We want to get to the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. You know, in, at the club level, not everybody's going to be an Olympian, but we can be Olympic in our pursuits. And, yes. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Another thing that you said there resonated with me because Coach Salo said, you know, one of the things about the ISL is these other countries are learning that we should maybe train short course meters more often. Olympic. Yeah. And, and, We've kind of had the advantage, you know, Skip Kenny told me one time when I was working Stanford swim camp, I said, why don't, why don't you and Ted train more long course? So you're, you're swimming at a lower velocity for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's so true. And that was in like 2008, man. Yeah. It's it. I mean, that's, we can talk about this all day, but that's, I mean, that's a cornerstone of, of our long course situation is, um, you know, enabling some very fast short swimming, you know, throughout the course of the week. And I think that that formula has been successful over the last three or four years. Coach Doug, <laughs> thanks so much for your time. Hopefully thanks, Mike. You'll be thanks for having me. Out. Yeah, sorry. I don't even have any team like swag to wear because I can't <laughs> go to work. <laughs> uh, make sure you tell John that before he watches.
Yeah, I will. Maybe you can just Photoshop, you know, a little uh, a little logo over here. Uh, this episode will be available for all of our viewers tonight, and we'll have it available on our YouTube channel as well. Coach Doug, good luck the rest of the season, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in person sooner than later. Thanks for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man.